tonight we will uh, have a chance to listen to the Dhamma. On this occasion, um, Venerable Ajahn Kalyano is visiting us after the meeting, Sangha meeting at Wat Bapong and traveling to visit his parents in England. He's come here to visit us here at Wat Mark Chan and this gives us a chance to listen to the Dhamma and particularly for those with uh, limited use of Thai language, there's a chance for a translated Dhamma talk and this will help with um, everybody's, uh, to improve everybody's understanding and clarity around the Dhamma. The way of practice um, we emphasize here is following in the path and the way of practice um, encouraged by our teacher, Lumpo Cha, uh, as he taught at Wat Nong Bapong. I myself uh, ordained there and studied and practiced with him as one of the uh, earlier generation of Central Thai uh, bhikkhus who went to study with him in Northeast Thailand. I ordained in the year 2519. In the way of training that Lumpur Cha encouraged and emphasized is um, a way of practice that supports the arising of samadhi and panya and is based on a very firm foundation of sila, morality and virtue and using the patimoka um, precepts, the 227 precepts of the patimoka as that foundation this is actually the way of practice that um, bhikkhus have, have trained in since the time of the Buddha. It's what we call the Dhamma, the Vinaya. And when practiced, it leads to progress on the path towards the end of suffering. And in modern times, the practice of this, uh, as taught by Lumpur Cha and practiced by the Sangha that grew up around him, has led to the growth of a very large Sangha inside Thailand and, and around the world indeed. The heart of this practice is what we call letting go or abandonment um, based on the clear awareness and the knowing of the way things are, the way uh, mental phenomena are, the way physical phenomena are, um, the way Rupa Sankara physical form formations, nama sankara, mental formations, uh, the way they are, the way they arise and pass away, and the true nature of them. Physical and mental formations together we usually refer to as the five khandhas, and it is the jitta, human jitta, that attaches to these five khandhas and clings to them as a self and sees them as self. So using the teaching of the Paticca Samuppada that the uh, Buddha gave and saw in his own practice to in, towards enlightenment, we're learning to contemplate this, to see this process of how attachment and clinging arises to the five khandhas. Um, we can see that it all stems from ignorance or misunderstanding of truth, avicca, and through a process of causal conditioning, this leads on to dukkha, all the different kinds of dukkha we experience, the suffering we experience as human beings, uh, birth, old age, sickness and death, um, unhappy states of mind, uh, stress, suffering of all different kinds. And the way to end this kind of dukkha is to learn to develop the awareness, the knowing that helps us to let go and abandon this attachment to the five candors that is based on ignorance. Um, we learn firstly to let go of our attachment to external things, uh, to that view that external things belong to us as a, as a self. We, we can own external things, so that might be material things, possessions, property, places, and even people. Uh, we're learning to see through that um, and to let go and the way we train in this is the way of training we call Satipatthana, as the Buddha pointed out in the Satipatthana Sutta. 
It begins with the teaching to establish mindfulness of physical form. That's both the physical form on the external level, meaning the uh, other people, other things, and then physical form on the internal level, meaning the 32 parts of this body that make up this human being that we have. And it's bringing, training the mind to develop this awareness of the way physical form is. And that awareness brings us to the understanding and the um, insight into the impermanent nature, the unsatisfactory nature, and the lack of self in this uh, internal and external physical form that's seen, and each dukkha anatta in all form. By practicing in this way, training the mind to reflect on these truths, it helps us to penetrate through the ordinary or apparent reality of our existence, the samuti satcha, <coughs> which we're normally caught into, and helps us to break through or liberate the mind to experience vimuti uh, and the letting go of this uh, deluded attachment. So how can we bring about the causes for us to abandon our attachments? We need to develop wisdom, insight. And for wisdom to arise, we must develop uh, the conditions that support the arising of wisdom, and that is the firmness, the peace and the firmness of samadhi, concentration. And the Buddha always said the development of samadhi brings great benefit to the practitioner. And that great benefit uh, in direct terms is the arising of wisdom. So we have to train ourselves to develop samadhi. And for that we also need to develop a firm foundation in virtue and in the discipline, the Vinaya. That's a firm foundation in the practice of restraint. Restraint in the precepts and the development of mindfulness, mindfulness of our training rules and practices. Through the continuous practice of this, uh, the result is that we start to gain peace of mind, more steadiness, more coolness and calm in our mind. And this allows us also to have enough um, peace of mind to be able to focus on an object, a meditation object, to practice uh, mindfulness of a meditation object. This quality of mindfulness or sati literally means recollection. So that would be we, we uh, the, the practice of virtue and the vinaya helps us to recollect our meditation object and bring up that quality of recollection. Samadhi means firmness of mind, one-pointedness of mind. And this comes about through the continuous presence of sati. Uh, so these two qualities, sati and samadhi, are related. They are, they are very much um, part of the practice and they support each other. As we keep developing sati, uh, we're focusing our sati both on the body, feeling, on the mind itself and the objects of mind. And as we do this regu regularly, frequently, with effort and continuously, this is what leads to the development of samadhi or the firmness of mind. It's natural in the beginning that we'll have some doubts about how to do this, how to practice. So Lumpur Cha gave us some um, good tips on this. He always emphasized that the develop, development of sati, mindfulness, involves learning how to let go of whatever craving is arising in the present moment. That means not giving in to moods of liking or disliking that are arising in the mind. These arise, these moods arise based on the sense contact that we have. Say, I, our, our eyes see a form, ears hear a sound, and so on. Normally, um, as we experience sense contact, the different objects that come to the mind, they stimulate this kind of craving, the liking and the disliking. And over time and repeated, the repeated arising of craving, this leads to attachment. 
Um, that attachment forms the basis for our existence and that existence is the basis for our future birth um, and birth, old age, sickness and death and all the different stress and suffering we experience. So the more we learn to establish sati, mindfulness in the present moment and not let the mind be drawn into craving, this liking and disliking. Every time we do that, we establish mindfulness, we're actually cutting off the causes for future bhava and jati or existence and rebirth. And over time practicing this, this is what will lead to the arising of understanding and experience in the practice that will help to remove our doubts about the right way, what is the right way to practice, the right way to go and so on. Nowadays there are many teachers and different places, monasteries and Buddhist centers which often um, put forward slightly different styles of practice and so there can be a lot of confusion amongst new practitioners. But if you keep practicing you'll see that the, the true path of practice always leads to this a development of sila, samadhi, panya and the penetration of the Four Noble Truths. Some practitioners, particularly lay people who are very busy and don't have so much time, uh, they often feel um, encouraged to go straight to looking and observing their mind. They feel they don't have much time to develop samadhi practice but we here in the monastery, we really have the best opportunity to develop ourselves in an all-round way. So we can really use this, this lifestyle of a bhikkhu to develop mindfulness in all postures and in a continuous way. And from that we'll actually be able to develop samadhi, the firmness of mind. So take this uh, lifestyle as a basis for developing mindfulness and samadhi. So from the minute you get up in the morning, try to develop sati of what you're doing, recollect what you're doing. If you're putting on your robe to leave your kuti, uh, bring up sati as you're doing that. Uh, if you go to chanting meditation, then this is a ta time to bring up sati. As you go out on Bindabhata, you take your bowl and your robes and you walk into the village. And this is a time to develop sati. When you come back and you're eating your food, you learn to eat with sati and restraint. If we practice in that way throughout the day, regularly bringing sati to bear on whatever activity we're doing, to be aware of our posture, to be aware of the body and mind at each moment of the day, whether we're sweeping, we're washing our bowls, uh, whatever the activity, we're learning to always bring the mind to the present moment. And if we do this, it helps to um, change our habit of mind. Like our normal habit of mind as we, before we came into the monastery is that because of the influence of avicca, say ignorance and delusion, the mind is always proliferating on, getting caught into moods, uh, thinking about the past, thinking about the future. But now we have the chance to develop sati in a very uh, determined way, in a very clear way, in each posture, in each activity. And we can keep bringing the mind back to the present moment. We can also contemplate the impermanence of our lives as human beings. We can, can't be sure how long we're going to live in this world, whether we'll reach old age or not, we don't know. We could even die today, we could die this very morning or in the afternoon or this evening. This is a contemplation, a recollection we can bring up as we're practicing mindfulness. And we can see that we don't know how much time left we have to practice, so we should really put our hearts and effort into developing mindfulness right now at this time as much as possible. We also in the beginning have to really defend, depend on our patience and our endurance in the practice um, and the firmness of our sila. Sometimes internally our mind is not yet very peaceful, we're still caught into our moods, the different moods based on liking and disliking of craving. Sometimes we might have greed or anger in the mind and we have, might have a sense of self arise based on the, these moods. 
but we must learn how to stop and reflect on our moods and to not let the mind get deluded by them to help uh, we must stop reflect on them try to detach and see that these are just the appearance of things the the conventional reality that we're normally getting caught into but if we can step back we can see with mindfulness that the body is just the body the mind is just the mind a thought is just the thought or an object is just an object of mind we can see that but we have to use a lot of patience with this maybe on the outside we 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 can keep our sila our precepts but on the inside the mind is not yet peaceful so we have to use some patience to deal with that until gradually over time our experience in the practice improves and our ability to contemplate develops then we'll really be able to let go of these things and develop some insight once we start to have some confidence and understanding in the way of practice uh, as taught by the Lord Buddha and Lumpur Cha this is what leads on to the arising of effort and energy in the practice and we start to have that sincere wish to practice and to uh, overcome suffering with this arising of effort and energy putting forth effort and energy into the practice then our mind starts to get a little bit stronger and it's this strength of mind that comes through effort in the practice that leads to um, the developing that skill where we can start to abandon our moods of liking and disliking that we normally experience but we really have to um, make the mind firm so that it won't just give in to every mood that arises just give in to moods of liking and disliking uh, sometimes our moods can come up very extreme in a very extreme way we really like something or want something or we really hate something or want to get rid of something we s still have to keep practicing this in the same way whether it's a very strong mood or a very subtle mood we keep having to learn to establish mindfulness to reflect on the experience and see it as just a condition of mind something that is not really us not really a self a me or a mine this is what allows us to let go and keep the mind in that place in the middle in the place of equanimity we can see that the more extreme the mood is the further away the mind goes from a place of equanimity then it's like the mind goes to a place where it's not correct it doesn't feel right it's not correct because it's not peaceful we can also see how our moods deceive us trick us and they're not really certain they change they come and go we like something we dislike something it's up and down in and out like this in in a way that's very uncertain so we can use that reflection just say this is uncertain or it's not sure as a reflection and when we're able to bring up that reflection and apply it to our own moods and attachments this is what helps to release the mind and let go whenever we notice akusala states of mind arising unwholesome unskillful states of mind arising that's where we have to bring up effort to to relieve the mind of that attachment to that mood we have to learn how to give it up let it go and to bring up wholesome states of mind to replace them one of the best ways to do this is to use a barikama a meditation object and when we notice the mind getting caught into unwholesome states then establish mindfulness by putting the mind onto the barikama object bringing up the uh, mindfulness of buddho or dhammo or sankho or any of the other meditation objects we can use we can also see that even as we're doing that as we're trying to put attention on a meditation object bringing up wholesome states of mind that we're not able to always do it continuously and the unwholesome states of mind might return or might slip in as we're trying to to put the mind onto the wholesome states so we have to keep catching that catching the mind as it changes and maybe slips into an unwholesome state and bring it back to the meditation object and the present moment as a way of letting go of that unwholesome state of mind whenever the mind becomes agitated or caught into some unwholesome proliferation 
learn how to catch that, bring it back to the Barikama and keep, it, keep a continuity of effort in this way. If you get caught into doubts about the way of practice, the right way to practice or whether we should practice or not, try to establish mindfulness and recognize doubt as doubt. See that this is at one of the five hindrances, which is kicha. If you're able to recognize doubt as doubt, just as that much, that will help you to let it go. You might find if you keep practicing in this way, keep bringing up effort into developing a meditation object, putting mindfulness, mindfulness on that object over and over again, there might be some times when it seems to go quite well. If it's going very well, maybe the meditation mantra, the word, if you're using, say, the word butto, might actually disappear and the mind just settles down into a cool, clear knowing, a cool, clear awareness. At that time, the jitta becomes very bright and we might experience pity and sukha arising and the mind becomes very peaceful and wholesome. It's at that point that it's we could say it's ripe or mature to see the Dhamma. And so it's, that's the time to con turn to contemplate, to see things uh, as they are. Say to contemplate the impermanence of our experience, to see the impermanent nature of this world. We contemplate that <coughs> whatever is born into this world must die, ourselves or other human beings Whatever arises must pass away. Whatever, say, material thing comes up, arises in this world, it must pass away, it must cease. All wealth, all possessions, all the different things we can have in this world, they don't really have any lasting essence. Um, as one contemplates in this way, then the mind starts to really gain more confidence in the Buddha Dhamma Sangha and the Buddhist path because one really can believe that it's true. One can see for oneself that it's true. This is where you could say our parami arises, where we really start to let go on a deep, very deep level by seeing anicca dukkha anatta. It's this kind of clarity that, that really can change the mind and develop. Um, a deep insight into truth and the more of this kind of insight we have then the deepen then the more our, our faith our confidence in the path deepens sometimes this insight much might, might just arise um, temporarily it arises and then passes away itself it's, it's not yet firmly established but if we keep practicing, there might be periods when we have very deep insight that seems to come up and last in the mind for many days. I myself has, have experienced this in the beginning of the practice. At first, I used to have doubts about the path of practice and where to go and used to have lapses in my mindfulness. But I could also see when I really put effort in and the, the sati, the mindfulness, was continuous, then the mind became very strong and insight would arise. I could see that when insight arises, it helps us to break through ignorance, avicca, and to penetrate the normal attachment to conventional wisdom or samuti satcha and, and upadana. It helps us to really break through that. And so it has a liberating force on the mind. When we have this kind of liberating insights, then it really um, affects the mind in a deep and profound way. We can see that our own life is something very impermanent. We've been born into the world, but we must die for sure. It's just, just a truth, a certainty that the mind comes to accept. Or we can see that any kind of material wealth that one can gain in this world, any kind of experience or, and wealth one can have is still just an Icha. And it's going to be the same in any life in the past we've had or in the future. Wealth is just something that arises and passes away. And life itself is something that just arises and passes away. When we really experience this in a very clear way, we can see the impermanent nature of this body and this mind and this life. Then. This is when the mind might experience the Lokutara Dhamma, the, the Dhamma that really helps us to transcend the world and let go of our attachments. <coughs> this kind of insight can arise 
for many days and nights at a time. So for myself, having deep insight like this for three days and nights, that's what led to my decision to ordain and become a monk. So please keep practicing. Keep putting effort into the practice. Keep learning to put your attention on the Barikama object. Uh, sometimes you might feel that you might experience some peace of mind. And when you do get peaceful, all the different external objects that you normally experience ex normally experience won't seem to bother you anymore. You won't seem to be too worried whether you're um, they're attractive or repulsive. Your mind won't get caught into that. This is the time when we can really understand the Four Noble Truths. The Lord Buddha himself was the first one to experience this. We have faith now in, in his teachings and in the path that he, he practiced, so now we must use that to practice for ourselves, to bring up energy, to follow him, follow his example. We all want the same kind of liberation like him. So we must really put forth effort and try to bring up energy in our practice. Keep trying to bring up and establish mindfulness until it is continuous. Then you'll see that your doubts about the practice will fade away and the mind will become very firm and that's when samadhi arises. Also use the different skillful means we have to develop wisdom. Sometimes we go to autopsies and see uh, the dissection of a human corpse. This can be a very valuable experience uh, and of course for insight to arise. What we have to do is take away what we've seen and experienced in that autopsy. Say when we come back to the what, we keep reflecting and contemplating what we've seen over and over again and, and comparing our own body, our own lives to what we've seen. We can see that our own body is going to go the same way. It will gradually become, it will die and then will become a corpse and decompose. When we contemplate like this, then it gives rise to a state of cool dispassion and detachment and from that we gain peace. One time I went to an autopsy and had this experience. I saw a young person's body, a young man just like myself. And I could see that this body that I have is just the same and will experience the same in the end. It will die and decompose in that way. Seeing like that helped me to break through the, the normal attachment to the, the conventional reality. I could see that when they put a uniform on him, he became a policeman. And that normally we would have that sense, oh, this is a policeman. But when you contemplate with mindfulness and insight arises, it breaks through that, no, that, that appearance. And you could see that it's just the nature of a human body to be an Icha Dukkha Anatta. You could, when you have insight like this, it breaks through the, the conventional appearance of things. And we can see all people are the same. The insight that arises is it's a bit like you see, start to see people more like dolls or puppets rather than as people uh, in the normal way. So please keep practicing. You might gain these kind of insights for yourself if you keep practicing with sincerity. So the foundation of practice that has been left to us by Lumpo Cha is something that we really have to put effort into studying and practicing. Uh, sometimes when we live with Lumpo Cha, monks might have different doubts and they would go to him with the doubts, ask questions. And he wouldn't always answer them directly. He might say that this will only you will only understand this point through your own practice. Um, and he would say that in the end you can't just uh, overcome doubts and gain knowledge and insight through asking questions of teachers. You have to get down and do the practice yourself. Sometimes people would even ask what is the quick way, the fast way to enlightenment, to attain the Dhamma. You'd say if if you want to um, become enlightened quickly, there's really you don't have to do anything. I had to go away and contemplate this for a long time before I understood, because uh, having contemplated this point, I realised that one who is liberated doesn't have to do anything. They don't have to practice. They don't have to do anything. 
But in the beginning we do need to create the right causes for the Dhamma to arise. We have to put effort into the practice, not give in to our laziness and our unwholesome states of mind. We have to learn to get up early, to put effort into developing mindfulness early in the morning. We have to learn to give up our attachments, say our, our sense of self, our ego, which usually is coming up through our different views and opinions and this sense of self, our conceit, which is always comparing and judging ourselves and others. We have to keep letting go of these things. If we keep letting go in this way, then our jitter will gradually ripen and mature and progress on the path. If the mind does become peaceful, then that's the time to contemplate the body, to use mindfulness to develop insight into the truths of Anicca Dukkha Anatta. We turn the mind to contemplate the thir 32 parts, to see them as unattractive, to see the asupa in this body. We can also contemplate to see the body uh, in terms of the four elements. And over time, this will lead to an e increased sense of peace and happiness inside on a deeper level. Contemplate the body to see its impermanence, to see how it one day it will die. What happens to that dead body? It, it must decompose. In the end, it just disappears. It's an Icha Dukkha Anatta. If we're contemplating the 32 parts, we have to do this in a very thorough way. We contemplate them one at a time and keep looking at them to see that they're in each dukkha anatta, and this is the way a liberating insight will arise. We must be very thorough. We do it forwards and backwards, forward order, reverse order, and just keep doing it over and over again until the mind really understands and sees the truth. The development of samadhi or peaceful concentrated states of mind is something that's difficult to develop, so we must be very patient. Our minds naturally tend to follow the five hindrances, give in to them, and whenever there's sense contact we're always getting caught into moods of liking and disliking which cloud and agitate the mind. This is because the mind is not yet very firm, it's easily unsettled, it easily wavers by, by the sense contact. So we must really train ourselves to stabilize this mind and bring it to a sense of stillness. When you have some stillness, then you can see that the, the mental proliferation, the thoughts we have are not really us. They're not really a me or mine, a person or a being. They're just conditions of the jitter. When the mind is still, we can see that greed is just greed. Anger is just anger. When the mind is strong and clear, it can do this, it can see mental states in this way. But we have to accept in the beginning that sometimes it will be weak and it will just follow the moods. When the mind does become strong with samadhi, then it leads to this sense of separation between the, the knower and the object. So we can see the body as just the body, mind as just mind. This is when the mind separates from the normal craving that feeds attachment. As we practice like this, there's one danger that we must be aware of. That is that once the mind does become more peaceful in samadhi um, and experiences the bliss, the happiness of that, and then it can become a little lazy and not wish to contemplate any further. In effect, what it's doing is it's just enjoying the peace of the rapture and the blissful states. It might see that, or, or delude itself and think that it's on a, a more refined level now and doesn't need to go back and contemplate these more chile coarse kilesas based on the attachment to the body. might see that um, when we contemplate the body that's something we do to, to let go of our lustful attachment and see that that's something very coarse now that the mind is experiencing great bliss, it doesn't want to do that anymore. So the teachers would say, at that point, if that does happen, you really have to force your mind to go black and contemplate this body. Uh, sometimes we've got knowledge, we've heard from teachers, we've read books, and we, we have this sense that oh, the body is just something very coarse. And that now we have this sense of a deep samadhi that we don't want to go back and be with these coarse objects. Uh, we don't want to contemplate lust and so on. But to really 
to develop um, the higher wisdom, the deeper wisdom, we have to do this. We can't be heedless at this point. So Lumpur Cha always emphasized this. He said, go back and contemplate the body. Try to get to the point where the mind just sees the body as just the body. This is where the most deepest refined wisdom will arise. It must come out of contemplation of the body. When we contemplate in this way, this is where Ugaha Nimittas and Patipaga Nimittas will arise. This is where we can move on to contemplate to see the body as just four elements. And w when it gets deep, this contemplation, we might just see this body is just a flow of energy. Might just see the air element as sort of strands, wisps of air. Um, you might see the different aspects of the four four elements just as, as strands or flows, energy flows around this body. And then we can turn to just see them as a Nietzsche Dukkha Anatta and see the lack of self in this body. It's this very refined level of contemplation that really leads to deep insight. And as we develop this, this in turn will pull up our samadhi, it will make our samadhi firmer and deeper. As our samadhi moves to a higher level, our sila will move to a higher level, we have a more refined level of sila. So keep practicing in this way, you can trust that this is the way of Lumpur Man, Lumpur Cha, they've already proven that it works. They've proven that it's a path that does really lead one to let go of the coarse defilements right to, through to our most refined defilements on each level and that it's a way to really develop sila samadhi panya to the most highest level. There's one time I used to have a doubt about Lumpur Cha. He, he sometimes would say things like that he could just see a monk from the way he walked he could see whether he's peaceful or not. But I thought about this and I could understand that when he's saying this, he's just speaking, um, he keeps the Vinaya, so he's not saying he can read their mind or know the level of their mind. He's just talking um, very directly on the level of insight. He could see if a, ma a monk walking through the monastery, he could tell the way they walk, the way they behave, whether they're peaceful or not. Really, he could see uh, the level of their mind internally as well. But he would say, I can just see from the way they walk whether they're peaceful or not. And that's true, isn't it? If someone's peaceful, well, it will lead to peaceful speech, peaceful action. You can tell from their external behavior whether they're peaceful or not. If they're not peaceful, well, it will come out in their external behavior. So we have to put effort into training on this level as well, the external level. Lumpur Cha always reminded us to to train our speech, well, speak little, then you can really be mindful of what you're saying. Uh, eat little, meaning learning to be restrained in the way you use food and the other requisites. Sleep little, don't just indulge in sleep, but just use it as a way to rest the body and then continue practicing. There's no need to doubt this way of practice, it's the, it's the direct way that leads to enlightenment. Many of our teachers have practiced in this way and, and gained enlightenment. I myself have practiced in this way and have no more doubts about this as, as the true way to practice. Sometimes in the past I experienced times when the mind became peaceful for many months at a time. Even going to sleep at night when I wake, woke up in the morning it was still peaceful. When it's like this, that, that's the time to really develop your ability to contemplate the body to develop wisdom. In the beginning though we have to r depend on our faith. We keep the precepts and we put effort into developing mindfulness and samadhi and gradually our insight will grow out of this. Keep finding ways to break through the five hindrances, to let go of them. If you're sleepy then use walking meditation as a, as a skillful means to deal with it. Go out walking at night in the dark. Sometimes you could try walking backwards if you're very sleepy or go to find a dangerous place like the new land we've purchased where the, the forest is still thick and there's many snakes around. Go to a place where it's dangerous and you'll find fear comes up. This will help you to see the, the craving and the attachment in your own mind and you can, you've got something to work with then. Keep contemplating this until you can let go of your fear and you can see it as an impermanent condition of mind. 
Maybe for lay people it's not yet correct to go out to fearful places. They might just practice mindfulness in their daily lives. But for monks we can do this if we're ready. We can go to a dangerous or a fearful place and really test ourselves and bring up effort and energy in the practice. So really use this vasa, this pansa time as a place to pr as a time to practice in harmony together. Keep putting effort into your practice to develop mindfulness. And you too can experience the insight like the Krubarajans. Please put effort into your practice. Develop a sincerity of practice, a real wish to further and progress in your practice so that you can abandon greed, anger and delusion and you can let go of your own unwholesome states of mind and find the highest happiness. The only way you can really overcome doubts is through developing experience in the practice. But keep to the path that Lumpur Cha gave us and you won't go wrong or lose your way. Nowadays it's very easy to be swayed by the things you hear from other teachers and places, but don't lose, lose track of what Lumpur Cha said and taught. Um, those other places could be wrong. If you just keep practicing what is already proven to be correct in this way, you, you can't go wrong and you will experience some peace and insight. <laughs>